It's uh, my pleasure to introduce John Gasirak, who will tell us a tale about a number of uh, billiards. So please, John. <laughs> Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation at Matrix and SMRI, and uh, I'm really excited to be here and talking about this uh, various billiards that some are integrable, some are uh, potentially integrable, depending upon what you believe to mean to be integrable. And, and so I'm, uh, I've had this, this talk kind of bouncing around in my head for a while, so I'm glad to finally have the opportunity to put it all together. So just as a, as a bit of an outline, uh, we'll go through just a, a introduction to planar Euclidean billiards and what's known about uh, integrability in various forms. I will then talk about um, Minkowski billiards and in a very particular setting um, that is the subject of uh, some of my postdoctoral work with uh, Milena Radnovich at the University of Sydney. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, magnetic variants of billiards. And there's a particular version of magnetic billiards that has seen sort of a resurgence in the last 10 years or so with regards to integrability. Uh, I think we're gonna hear from Misha Bialy later this week who has done much of the work on that um, along with Andrei Miranov. And, uh, and then another form of magnetic billiards is something that I worked on for my uh, doctoral thesis. And so there's still some, some open work there as well that's still related to these magnetic versions of, uh, of billiards. So uh, we'll start with basics of billiards. And uh, when we think about mathematical billiards, this is a dynamical system uh, that consists of some planar set that we'll call uh, omega. And uh, that we call the billiard table. And then we have a uh, point mass in its interior that we call the billiard ball that moves in a straight line under no external forces. There's no friction. There's just conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And so uh, we get that the uh, that upon hitting the, the boundary, we have, a, we have equal angles, uh, angle of instance equaling angle of reflection that is just a, a geometric uh, version of these uh, rules of conservation of energy and momentum. And of course, we can see what happens as this continues on and, and bounces, say, n times in this rectangular table. So we just have a starting point where that x is, and, and we can see where this continues uh, to move. Now, of course, the billiard dynamics is very dependent upon the shape of your billiard table or the geometry of the, uh, of the underlying system in which you're dealing with. And so whether you have a convex you know, table with a sufficiently smooth boundary like a circle or an ellipse is going to have very different dynamics than having, say, a, a polygonal table or one that has, um, say, negatively curved boundary. And so these are sometimes called focusing billiards. Of course, we can always think about billiards as a version of geodesic flow on a manifold with boundary. Depending upon what kind of question you, you ask, your table is going to have some, some different geometry or different shape to it. And so, of course, if we have a, a sufficiently smooth boundary such that we can draw a tangent line to it at a point, we can define uh, the reflection at a point on the boundary just by drawing the tangent line to the boundary at that point and then measuring the angle made with the incoming velocity vector and the angle made with the outgoing velocity vector and making sure that those are equal. Alternately, uh, one way that we can define this reflection law is by decomposing, say, an incoming velocity vector into tangential and normal components with respect to that tangent at the boundary. And the, uh, the velocity beforehand is going to have uh, the tangential component staying the same and the normal component instantaneously changes sign upon hitting the boundary. So this decomposition into tangential and normal components also means that this, you know, that this is going to be dependent upon the, the metric that you use in order to, uh, to measure this orthogonality for, for this tangential and normal component. And so of course, there are several different types of billiards that you can talk about. You can talk about polygonal billiards relating to uh, geodesic flows on singularity or on translation surfaces. There's strictly convex billiards, uh, which is sometimes called Birkhoff billiards uh, because in the early 1900s, uh, billiards were, were seen as sort of a, a prototypical example of, of a Hamiltonian system. And in, in this setting, uh, you, you have this coexistence of 
regular uh, behavior, so periodic trajectories and, and things that are a bit more predictable, and uh, chaotic dynamics as well, depending upon uh, some uh, conditions on whether or not your boundary is or your billiard, billiard table is convex or strictly convex. And then the, the last one, uh, you can have concave or dispersive billiards where nearby uh, trajectories will move apart from one another exponentially. And this is where you can talk a bit more about um, ergodic theory and more of the, the measure theoretic side of, uh, of, of dynamics. So where we're going to, to focus is on this convex or strictly convex billiards. So one way that we can, uh, that we can describe billiards in, in some uh, strictly convex domain with, uh, with uh, sufficiently smooth boundary is that we can parameterize the, the boundary by arc length and that induces an orientation on the boundary. And we can, uh, we can define what we call the billiard map that I'm just gonna call T1 here. It takes a arc length position coordinate and an, ang and an inward pointing velocity angle uh, immediately after a collision. It takes that position and angle coordinate to the next position and angle coordinate of a, of a reflection. So it sends an S and a theta to the next S and theta corresponding to a, the, uh, the, the next reflection. And of course, because these are moving in straight lines in between these reflection points, the dynamics is, is pretty much determined by the, the coordinates S and theta at each one of these points. And in between, we just know to connect, say, this point with this point with a straight line. So the simplest example is that of a circular billiard. Uh, there are rules for circular billiards written by Lewis Carroll of Alice in Wonderland fame, uh, also a mathematician. And so there, there are many more rules that don't fit on the slide, but uh, at least having some rules for a physical circular billiard is, is kind of interesting. So in this, uh, in this circular billiard setting, we can actually explicitly write out what this billiard map is because uh, by rotational symmetry and just some, some uh, basic trigonometry, if the inward pointing angle theta here means that there's going to be an arc so that of, uh, of, of measure two theta on the inside, and because the, the radius of a circle is, tan is uh, orthogonal to the tangent, then uh, we, we can see that this angle theta and that angle theta will be the same and that the distance traveled from, say, this first collision point to the next collision point is exactly 2r theta. By rotational symmetry, I mean, this, these angles theta are the same, and so this angle and this angle up here are also going to be the same as well. So theta is itself an integral of motion, and we can think about the circle as being uh, integrable. And this being able to write up this billiard map in this setting is, uh, it's a bit of a, Unicorn, I would say, being able to physically or to write out explicitly in terms of S's and thetas what this, what the coordinates are of the next collision point is, is fairly rare. So this is you know, a pretty nice behavior. If the angle theta is a rational multiple of pi, then uh, we, we get periodic behavior. And, uh, and so, for example, if, uh, if we have a rational number of P on Q that is in this interval from zero to one half, there will be infinitely many periodic orbits with uh, rotation number p over q. So in these pictures, we have say uh, rotation number one half in the leftmost picture just corresponds to a diameter of the circle. And it's part of infinitely many periodic orbits because of course, on a circle, there are infinitely many diameters. So we're, we can consider this orbit geometrically different from the one that say goes across horizontally or you can add it at an angle. And then we have, say, um, equilateral triangles or a regular pentagon for theta being pi over three or pi over five. Theta is two pi over seven. It has a winding number of two and a period of seven. Uh, the other thing that uh, this interval of rotation numbers is in this interval from zero to one half because of what's called time reversal symmetry. So same as picture for theta being pi over three, this, uh, this corresponds to a rotation number of one third but there's, uh, there's exactly the same triangle is traced out, but in reverse, it has rotation number two thirds. So for every P over Q in, you know, from zero to one half, there's a corresponding trajectory that is just traversing the same one in reverse in the interval from one half to one. But of course, not every angle is uh, rational with respect to pi. And so 
Uh, in this case, every trajectory is going to be tangent to a concentric circle in the middle. And this is something that we call a caustic. And in the setting, the, uh, the collision points on the boundary will fill out a dense set as uh, the number of collisions goes to infinity. And uh, these line segments will, uh, will fill out this, uh, this annulus as well. So uh, we saw this with the circle, but as a more general term, we, we call a, a caustic, a curve such that after each reflection, the, uh, the billiard will remain tangent to that curve at you know, a different point, but will remain tangent to that curve after each reflection. So understanding uh, the properties of caustics is, you know, is very useful when it comes to understanding the behavior of some of these uh, trajectories. And for every convex caustic, there's gonna be an invariant circle in phase space, uh, but the, the converse is not necessarily true because you could have an invariant circle in phase space uh, that may not necessarily be convex. Uh, at least in this picture, we have an ellipse and another, another ellipse. Those are nice and differentiable and all that, but your caustics for an arbitrary billiard table may not necessarily have these, uh, may not be smooth, it may not be convex. So when we talk about integrability in billiards, there, of course, there are many different ways we can define integrability. And so we can talk about uh, Louisville Arnold integrability and C0 integrability. Uh, C0 integrability meaning uh, the existence of a foliation by um, invariant Lagrangian submanifolds. And so geometrically, we can think of, of this as saying that uh, integrability kind of means that part of the, the billiard table is foliated by, uh, by caustics. Here for the, the phase space of a circle is not terribly exciting. I mean, this is integral, integrable, but each one of these is, uh, we have a position coordinate on the, the horizontal axis and an angle coordinate on the vertical axis. And so we can see pretty easily that the, the angles are, are fixed uh, with all these iterations of this map. And so if we want to think about caustics, understanding their geometry and their relationship with integrability is, is of interest. So we can ask questions about uh, whether caustic or whether there exist billiard tables or billiards that have uh, at least one caustic. And the answer is yes. Uh, that means of what's called a string construction. So if you give me a, uh, a, a smooth, closed, uh, you know, convex curve, then take a string of length larger than the perimeter of that curve and pull it taut. And there are going to be two points, you know, here they're A and B, but you can think about moving this point in which you're pulling the string taut and sort of moving that around your billiard table without there being any slipping. And the set of all uh, points C, so that you're pulling this, you know, the string taut all the way around, will be a billiard table that has this given curve as a caustic. And by, by thinking about this string construction, I mean, these line segments are themselves tangents to, uh, to this, this curve that, that you gifted me. And so with the string construction, you can always say be given a caustic and construct a table from that. You can also ask about if there are billiard tables with infinitely many caustics. So, sorry, uh, is the question here with at least one given caustic? So, well, do there exist because I mean you showed the example before with a billiard with a caustic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we know the answer is yes, but if you mean given a caustic, is there always a billiard table? Is that the question? Or? Yes, yeah. So, so the idea is just generally speaking, you know, is there going to be a, a billiard table or so? So, yeah, I think, I think maybe putting it the way that you said makes a little bit more sense that given any caustic, you can create a billiard table that has that curve as a caustic. Yeah. Uh, we can ask if there are billiard tables that have infinitely many caustics. And uh, the answer is yes, with a uh, coordinate change via uh, Lazutkin in the 1970s that proved a, a KM type theorem to say that there's uh, a Cantor set of caustics that accumulate near the boundary. And these are sometimes called whispering gallery nodes where you have trajectories that stay you know, very close to the boundary as, uh, and don't venture very, very far. And so it just kind of skips along the boundary very closely. Uh, and, and that's kind of the geometric idea behind this part. And of course, you can ask the question of, are there billiard tables that do not have any caustics? 
And the answer is yes. If the boundary has a point of uh, vanishing curvature, then there will then there will be uh, no caustics that accumulate near the boundary. And then we can say that uh, this is you know this this uh, point down here by Mather from the 1980s. This is related to uh, why we can talk about convex failures or strictly convex failures because of, of this uh, you know this issue right here. If uh, if the boundary has a point of vanishing curvature. So then the, the, the next step up from the circle is, of course, the, the ellipse, where we can talk about uh, the billiards inside an ellipse. So here, I mean, this is just a picture of a, an ad that ran in the New York Times in the 1960s uh, to illustrate this new, brand new game that's taking over the world called uh, Elliptical. You can see how, how well that, uh, that went, considering how many elliptical bo uh, pool tables there are in the world. So, for the billiards in an ellipse, your trajectories can basically basically be classified into one of uh, one of three families. So either your billiard trajectory is not going to uh, pass the line segment that connects one focus to the other, that's what these big blue dots are. So if it doesn't cross that line segment, then the trajectories never will. And here, uh, each one of these reflections is tangent to an ellipse here that is confocal with the boundary. If the uh, if the, the billiard crosses the line segment that connects one focus to the other, then it always will after every reflection. And here we see you know, a, a caustic curve here that is a hyperbola that's confocal with the boundary. And there's a small detail that say with some of these trajectories, the tangency may not necessarily occur on the interior of this billiard or of this billiard table. And so say for this first line segment here, you can imagine that. If we were to extend this further down, that the extension of that line segment will become tangent uh, outside the boundary, and that's that's okay. That's still the same uh, tangency idea. It's just not occurring inside the billiard table. And then, of course, there's the the third option. You can either cross the this line segment, or you can not cross it, or you can uh, pass through a focus. And so if you have a trajectory that passes through one focus, it alternately will pass through the, the other focus after each reflection. And this, as this picture kind of illustrates, these trajectories that go through uh, you know, one focus and then the other and so on, this will eventually converge on the, the major axis of the ellipse. Uh, you, you, you can prove, say that uh, you can put an epsilon neighborhood on the, uh, on the major axis and that for some n large enough, your trajectories will always be within that epsilon neighborhood. And so, of course, if you ever find yourself with a, an actual elliptical billiard table uh, and you have a pocket at one focus, you know exactly what to do if you want to hit it off the wall and land it in the, the pocket. You just have to hit it through the, uh, the little tiny white mark that you see right there. That's where the, the other focus is. So you can make money off of your friends if, if you want to be a, an elliptical pool shark. Here's a picture of the, the phase space for uh, an elliptical billiard. We can see that we have these, uh, these uh, invariant curves correspond to, uh, to caustics. These ones that are sort of a single piece up here, these correspond to elliptical caustics. And these ones that have uh, you know, these eyes that are staring back at you, these correspond to hyperbolic uh, or caustics that are hyperbolas uh, with respect to the boundary. Then we have period two orbits that are the, the pupils of these eyes, and then we have these uh, these hyperbolic points here, here, here. And so, you know, again, this horizontal axis this is the arc length coordinate along the boundary, and the vertical axis on this is the angle of measurement uh, that is in that interval from zero to pi. So, you know, here this phase space is, is foliated by these uh, invariant curves. Uh, a few more properties. Um, these aren't super uh, super important, but um, we we might as well say them. But that uh, we've got uh, periodic orbits uh, p over q for every rational p over q. There are exactly two uh, two periodic orbits that are the uh, major and minor axes of the ellipse. Um, we have infinitely many uh, convex caustics and infinitely many uh, non-convex caustics for ellipses and hyperbola. And uh, the ellipse itself, aside from the segment that connects uh, one focus to the other, 
is uh, foliated by convex caustics and is integral. And so the, the Birkhoff Peritsky conjecture basically says that for the planar billiard in an ellipse, this is the only uh, the only planar integral billiard, that there aren't other shapes that also are uh, integral in this sense. So, so we've talked about Euclidean billiards. The next, they will talk a little bit about our um, Minkowski billiards. And uh, I just want to have uh, a little bit of a geometric or just remind you of a few terms that are uh, relevant. So if we have a quadric in, or a quadric in an inner product space V uh, can be written as this inner product of uh, AX and X equaling some constant M for a self joint operator A. And the, uh, the family of dual quadrics, this A minus lambda times the identity inverse times X, inner product with X equaling a constant M is called confocal. And for, for our purposes, we'll, we'll just think about A as being a, a diagonalizable matrix with distinct positive entries that just correspond to um, semi-major and semi-minor axis lengths or their, their square roots. So with that, that notion of confocal, uh, we can have, we, we can see that say in the Euclidean setting with the Euclidean inner product that the confocal family looks exactly as we remember from uh, say secondary school geometry class where um, this, you know, A is a diagonal two by two matrix with entries A and B. And uh, this, we're setting this confocal family equal to one. And lambda is this confocal parameter, where if lambda is less than B, then this corresponds to an ellipse. If lambda is between B and A, this corresponds to the, the blue hyperbolas. And if lambda is larger than A, then we get uh, imaginary curves. Now, of course, in, in this picture, uh, there, there are a bunch of, uh, there's, there's some nice geometry too, where every single point in the plane can be described as the intersection of two members from this confocal family. We can also see that the blue curves and the red curves uh, intersect orthogonally. So you know, anywhere that you have an intersection of a red and a blue curve, that intersection is in fact orthogonal if you were to measure, look at the, the tangent lines to those curves at that point. And these are exactly just some uh, classical theorems from Euclidean geometry. So there's a theorem by Jacobi that says that through uh, a generic point in Rn, there are paths n confocal quadrics and they're pairwise orthogonal, just like in the, the previous slide here. We're in R2 and every point can be described it, or there are two members from this confocal family that, uh, that intersect in that point. Uh, a generic line is tangent to n minus in Rn uh, is tangent to n minus one confocal quadrics. Uh, from this family whose tangent hyperplanes uh, at that point of tangency uh, are pairwise ortho orthogonal. And then there's a, a combination of uh, this Jacobi and uh, Chalet theorem that basically says that a uh, tangent lines to a geodesic on an ellipsoid in Rn are tangent to n minus two fixed uh, confocal quadrics. And so understanding these, uh, this confocal family and the, this tangency idea is, is important because we're thinking about, you know, how does this fit into this, this billiards picture? And the answer, of course, has to do with caustics, because we, we've seen, at least with the previous pictures, that, uh, that a curve or that the caustics for an ellipse are themselves are from this confocal family or this family of curves that's, that's confocal with the boundary. And that, you know, this also plays in with the, the tangency idea to uh, you know, having lines tangent to a curve that's a member of this uh, confocal family. So graduating from Euclidean to Minkowski, uh, we can consider an n-dimensional Minkowski space uh, where we have the, the minus sign on the last term. And everything I'm about to talk about uh, also holds for uh, arbitrary signature with say k pluses and j minuses in your, in your metric. There are some small adjustments that need to be made, but uh, you, you can imagine that everything I'm about to do also holds with uh, an arbitrary signature. So in Minkowski space, uh, given a vector, we have what we call space-like, light-like, and time-like vectors based on whether the squared norm is positive, zero, or negative. Um, and then, of course, I mean, this is a vector space, and so we'll call uh, things orthogonal if their inner product is zero. And it's slightly, this formulation of the confocal family down here is slightly different than what we had seen before, but it's only through a, a coordinate change that we can, uh, that we can see that these are really uh, ways of, of doing the same thing. 
And so, you know, the first n terms all, or first n minus one terms all look like they were before, but now in the uh, in the last term we'll have a plus uh, rather than a, a minus, and that's our indication of, of our uh, signature. So in the plane, the, the Minkowski confocal family looks a little different, which we expect. We have a different inner product. And uh, so these are the green hyperbolas if lambda is between uh, negative infinity and B. So these are these ones that open around the, the x-axis. We have the blue ellipses if lambda is between minus B and A. And uh, hyperbolas that open kind of around the, the y-axis if lambda is between A and infinity. We also have these red separating lines, and so there are these regions that are are not touched by any of these, um, by by any uh, of the, these curves. So, I think, yeah. Uh, so, what, in the end, I mean, this this billiards inside of a uh, Minkowski ellipse is something that's going to be integrable. I forget whether I put that in here or not, but I want to just mention it. It's integrable in the same way as it was for the uh, for the including ellipse. We can talk about the, the billiard reflection law in this setting just very uh, very quickly, in terms of uh, decomposing the velocity vector before a collision and the velocity vector after a collision, in terms of tangential and normal components to the the tangent at the uh, to the boundary at the point at the collision point. So by, by sort of instantaneously changing the sign on the normal component, that's exactly how we're going to think about uh, this billiard reflection law. Now, to, to decompose it in this way. Oh, is it? Uh, so they can be just the same vector. Well, yes. Yeah, so so that's that's this technicality oh, down here. No, you're 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 thinking right on, on the right track. So uh, before I, I get to that, just with this decomposition, this, this inner product of the uh, velocity vector with itself before and after collision is, uh, is equal. And so the type is preserved, meaning that if you have a, a billiard trajectory that is space-like, after each reflection, it will continue to be space-like. There isn't going to be any switch from space-like to light-like after a collision or anything like that. So already based on just the velocity vectors in this Minkowski setting, the velocity vectors are in one of three families. They're light-like, they're space-like, or they're time-like. And for infinite time in both directions, they will continue to be in that exact family. And so now the, the technicality comes in, which is what, uh, what Yuri was asking about. So it's very possible that the, the normal component could be light-like. And, and so this, uh, this reflection is technically not defined. But what we do is that we, we think about uh, the limiting behavior of nearby trajectories the same way that for a billiard and a polygon at a vertex, you can, you can define the, uh, the reflection at a vertex by looking at limiting nearby behavior. So say near a, a corner of a, of a billiard, um, you can think about a trajectory that hits one wall, then hits the next wall, and then comes back in, the, you know, in a very similar direction and look at that limit as those points approach the, the corner. And so what that means is that uh, if we have this, this technicality case down here, then a light-like, or if the normal component is light-like, then uh, the nearby trajectories are going to say that this billiard will hit this point, turn around, and then come back in the exact direction that it came from. And we'll count that, that, uh, that reflection as occurring twice by thinking of it in terms of that limiting behavior. And so here's a, a picture of exactly that idea. So here are uh, six periodic light-like trajectories in uh, Minkowski ellipse. And in red and green, we have some uh, six periodic trajectories. But in blue, we can think about, say, these red points is getting closer and closer to one another over here. And they, they still are going to reflect back you know, parallel to one another. And so at this point, when the normal component of the, of the, the tangent vector at that point is going to be light-like, then we think about this blue trajectory as being six periodic because we'll start at the top, hit once, twice, three times, four times, five times, and then back up for that sixth time. So already in this Minkowski setting, there's uh, there, there really is a, a different type of geometry. I mean, the, the geometry is very much affecting the properties of our, our trajectories. I think that's all I wanted to say there. But 
when, when it comes to the, the work that Milena and I have done, uh, we can look at the three dimensional Minkowski space and just for uh, making some exposition a little cleaner, we can have the signature be minus plus plus. And uh, if we take the inner product of some arbitrary vector in, in this three dimensional space and take its inner product of itself and set that equal to one, we get a hyperbolate of one sheet. Uh, and I'm going to call that H just to, uh, to make it easier to, uh, to describe. And we'll think about our confocal family as being set equal to zero so that th these uh, surfaces that go with this confocal family are cones that intersect the origin. And we'll call the intersection of the these confocal surfaces and the hyperbola of one sheet, we'll call those confocal curves. So, uh, of course, if we want to talk about billiards on some surface in this Minkowski space, we have to talk about geodesics. And so, uh, the, there's a very nice geometric description of geodesics in this setting where uh, they are the intersection of central planes, so planes that contain the origin with the hyperbolate of one sheet. And so with this metric, you can have uh, space-like geodesics that are when you intersect this plane with the hyperbolate and you get an ellipse. You have time-like uh, time -like geodesics where you have uh, two branches of a hyperbola that are the, the intersection of this plane and the hyperboloid. Or you can have light-like trajectories that are straight lines. And here you're using the fact that the hyperbolate of one sheet is a doubly ruled surface. Uh, and so this, this last point is, it's kind of important, and I, I, I'm, I'm just going to sweep this under the rug a little bit, but uh, so this hyperboloid under this, you know, in this, this metric is not geodesically connected, even though it's geodesically complete. So you can have two points that are not connectable by a geodesic, but you can extend every geodesic infinitely uh, for infinite time in either direction. And you can imagine uh, this, this occurring, say, with, the, with a time-like trajectory where you can have two points that are on separate branches of this hyperbola that is the intersection of this plane and the hyperboloid. And so those two points that lie on opposite branches are not gonna be connectable with a geodesic. So if we wanna think about uh, you know, billiards, we also wanna think about geodesic connectability when it comes to this, uh, you know, this, this surface with this metric. And so at the bottom here, uh, this is just a, a computational test about whether uh, two points are geodesically connectable okay, based on uh, taking the inner product of one point or the position vectors of one point and another, as long as they're not antipodal. So you know, we can say whether they you know, lie on a space-like, time-like, or, or light-like trajectory. Oh, so, yeah. so, so your typical H, yeah. um, this is the point which is defined by the metric, right? Or the matrix of the uh, so so uh, so H. This is just um, this is the, the this is of one sheet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just yeah. 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 So negative x squared squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. Right. But the other one, you should probably have the same property that the intersection of this Yeah. Well. So so, so this is just uh, talking about what the geodesics are on that on that on that hyperboloid in in general. And what we will talk about is uh, these curves of intersection with this confocal family next. Yeah. So, so now if we want to think about playing billiards on this, uh, this surface of constant curvature, then uh, we want to have billiards be in compact sets because otherwise a billiard could go up to infinity and your billiard is, is you're, you're done. There's no more dynamics to really consider. And so, uh, in particular, if A is just a diagonal matrix, or, or if this, this, uh, this sort of this cone bounds a compact region on H, then A inverse is diagonalizable. And so there are two topologically distinct kind of billiard tables that you can have. So these blue curves are the, the confocal curves, and the, these blue surfaces are the, the members of that confocal family and how they can intersect with this hyperbola. And so on the left, we'll call this the collared H ellipse. And then on the right, we'll call this a transverse H ellipse. And uh, because of the symmetry here, we'll just think about one of these regions as being uh, the, the boundary in which we will be having our billiards. So inside this top region or bouncing back and forth between uh, the, the two boundary components on this uh, collared H ellipse. So, so we have these two, you know, these two geometrically different possibilities. 
And where the dynamics comes in is from uh, an approach of uh, Vassalov and Moser. They used uh, a matrix factorization technique in the 1990s to model a bunch of discrete dynamical systems um, through, a, through this matrix factorization technique. And so one of the, the examples that they applied this, this concept to was to uh, build within a confocal family on the hyperbolate of two sheets and also on the, on the, uh, on the sphere as well. And essentially, they, they showed that in both of these settings that, uh, that these are integrable billiards in, you know, with this n plus one dimensional uh, sphere and n plus one dimensional uh, hyperbolic space. So skipping the details there, but uh, the point is that we can apply that idea to this hyperboloid with making some, uh, some changes along the way. But here are just some pictures of, of billiards in uh, this collared and transverse H ellipse. And the point is that uh, we've, we've shown that, that it is uh, integrable. And so the, these integrals look very similar to if we were to write out uh, the integrals of motion for billiards in an ellipsoid in RM. But one of the big differences are these capital J's that come from uh, the signature of the metric. And so there, there's some adjustments for uh, you know, pluses and minuses there, but the idea is that we have uh, that this is an integrable system. There's also a caustic reflection property, just like we had with billiards in the um, in the plane. That there's also uh, a reflection, a caustic type property uh, that occurs here as well. So here's just a, a quick picture of what we mean by this caustic reflection property. On the left, this is a period six trajectory. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And on the right, uh, this is where if we look at extensions of each one of these. Uh, these trajectories that this tangency does occur where this, this surface is the, you know, the member of the confocal family. And we can see that, there, that this curve of intersection is our, our caustic. So as we saw with you know, planar Euclidean billiards that understanding caustics is useful when it comes to integrability or is this, you know, this geometric manifestation of integrability on this surface as well. It's, it's very similar. It's just that we have uh, a so, you know, we have this curve of intersection between these two surfaces that are acting like our caustics. But this tangency still occurs if we do this uh, extension. Sorry, Shalom, it's the extension. So the extension is that each one of these, uh, you know, each one of these is an arc of a geodesic on the surface. Oh, okay. yeah. And so then we just extend that, that arc, say, you know, at, at, at this point where normally we would be reflecting if we just extend that geodesic, there will be a, a tangency that occurs outside of the billiard table. So, and is that, uh, I'm trying to connect the two pitches. So when you extend it, do you get one of the other intersections? Is that guaranteed? So, so yeah, with, with this, I mean, there's, um, yeah, the, fa the fact that this extends and then comes to another, uh, another, yeah. yeah, so that that is uh, that's not a coincidence at all. Okay. Uh, that that's here. These are just pictures of periodic trajectories, yeah. and so because they're periodic, is and the fact that the geodesics themselves are periodic okay. together kind of gives you that if you were to extend one of these, you're going to get a later segment yeah. in this. And so the, these pictures on the left is just a periodic you know, six periodic, and then the same six periodic trajectory, but with extending yeah. each one of these, uh, you know, extending each one of these geodesics to illustrate the, the tangency, the yeah. caustic uh, kind of property over here. Uh, just a few more pictures, uh, in, and then I'll, I'll switch gears to this mag to the magnetic setting. But you know, even with uh, period eight, these look a little bit different. And then on the transverse case. Uh, this is kind of a, a top-down view. This is, a, this is a period three trajectory and a period five trajectory as well. So there, there's nice pictures to go with this, but this periodic part doesn't necessarily have to do with integrability. So in my remaining 18 minutes or so, uh, I want to talk about magnetic versions of billiards and notions of integrability. So for magnetic billiards, this is where you have, uh, this was studied by uh, Robnick and Barry in the 1980s initially, and you treat the, the billiard as a charged particle that's moving under the influence of a magnetic field that is orthogonal to your table. And so 
if we have this, you know, this magnetic field, this very simple homogeneous magnetic field, uh, the this charged particle is going to move under the uh, the influence of the Lorentz force, where the uh, the acceleration is going to equal the you know three dimensional cross product between the velocity and the magnetic field. So this corresponds to uniform circular motion, and the radius is what we're going to call mu. That uniform circular motion is you know, proportional to one on the magnetic field strength. So very strong magnetic field means you're moving in very small circular arcs. Very weak magnetic field means you're moving on very large circular arcs. You still have the same reflection rule, but now, you know, of course, you're, you're measuring the velocity vector at that that is tangent to that circular arc at that instant of, uh, of impact with the boundary. You're still measuring that angle of theta the same way. Uh, for our purposes, we'll just assume that the charge times the magnetic field strength is negative so that these magnetic uh, Billiards are going to be moving in the uh, anti-clockwise direction or counterclockwise. And one thing that really sets these magnetic billiards aside or apart from standard billiards is that there are three what are called curvature regimes. And the dynamics is qualitatively different based on the relative sizes of this Larmor radius, the radius of these, uh, these magnetic arcs, and the minimum and maximum radii of curvature of the boundary. So you can imagine that if uh, if mu is smaller than the minimum radius of curvature of the boundary, that you're going to be moving on smaller circles that maybe are going to stay closer to the boundary. And so you're going to have slightly more regular behavior. And if mu is much larger than the maximum uh, uh, radius of curvature, then you're moving on arcs of circles that are much larger. And so there might, there might be, you know, the dynamics is very different there, especially, and then uh, same in this intermediate one, this is where there is the least amount known is this intermediate regime. So here are some fun pictures, just of, of periodic magnetic billiards that are uh, in the circle, period two, period three, period five, and period five. The circle is uh, integrable. We again have theta as a constant of motion, and we can describe uh, in a slightly different way uh, all periodic uh, magnetic billiards in a circle. In an ellipse, it's slightly different. I mean, here we have the two, um, two period two magnetic uh, orbits in a circle. And down here, this is period three, but obviously, you know, this is very different than, say, a period three trajectory in an ellipse. You, know, you, you very much have this lack of symmetry to occur. So here are just a picture of a sample trajectory and, uh, and it's, it's phase space. So when mu in this magnetic setting, when mu is less than the minimum radius of curvature, we have all of these circles that are, that are staying relatively close to the boundary. And in this picture, the different colors represent uh, the blue are the uh, magnetic arcs themselves. In orange, these are the centers of each of the, uh, of each of the circles, of each of these magnetic arcs. And the purple points, these are the uh, intersection points of the boundary. And in red, it's kind of hard to see, but those are uh, the both of the boundary. And on the right, you can see that there are lots of invariant curves uh, that correspond to uh, trajectories that stay very close to the boundary. But then we also have these, these little islands around uh, some periodic trajectories as well. So we, there is still some uh, nice and exciting things that happen in, in this setting. In the intermediate one, in the intermediate regime, this is where we have a lot more uh, chaotic behavior. And in this picture on the right, there are still some, some invariant curves, but uh, there's, it's a little, it's not shown here just because I picked and, and choose uh, what orbits are shown here, but all of these areas that have white in them are usually filled with just a, a sea of chaotic orbits. So you just get this, this dust in there that corresponds to orbits that look like this. And you, you can see that there are some invariant curves in here that have some, that if we were to look at them over in, in this side would look really, really interesting, but having these, you know, KM kind of orbits are, are really, uh, really fun to look at. And then in the in the, the larger case, uh, this is starting to look a little bit more like uh, billiards in an ellipse, but we also have a bunch of uh, chaotic behavior happening here when, uh, when mu is larger than the maximum radius of curvature. And you can see that these are all, say, this, this uh, trajectory corresponds to one of these invariant curves up here because 
these large arcs are kind of curving towards the boundary and staying very close to the boundary as we go. So there still is a caustic in here. It is not confocal with the boundary, but there exists uh, a caustic um, with in, that corresponds to say some of these invariant curves up here. So uh, talking about caustics, we can ask the same set of questions that we asked for planar Euclidean billiards in the magnetic setting. So uh, we can reformulate this first question as Brian suggested that given some, some caustic curve, can we create a billiard table such that there is a magnetic billiard that has that given curve as a caustic? The answer is yes, but it's, there's a string type construction that essentially looks at level sets of a conveniently constructed function. And those are going to correspond to uh, tables that have uh, the given curve as a caustic, but it's dependent upon the magnetic field strength. Uh, this is worked by uh, Gutkin and Dubochnikov in the early 2000s. Are there examples of billiards that have infinitely many caustics? There's, there's work from the 1990s by Berglund and Kuntz uh, that showed that a positive measure set of caustics accumulated at the boundary using a, a perturbative, uh, like a KAM type um, perturbative approach. And they, they really only occur in three, three settings um, you know, when, when you are gonna have these, uh, the, these caustics. And then uh, questions about whether there exists magnetic billiard tables without caustics there isn't an analogous uh, statement to, to the, uh, the planar case because uh, some of the other work of, of Berlin and Kuntz shows that uh, caustics can still exist even if there are points of negative curvature of the boundary. And where, where this comes in, I'm sorry for those on, on Zoom, but if you have a, you know, a curve that's kind of kidney shape, this magnetic billiard can still stay sufficiently close to the boundary even if there's negative curvature there. So, so then, you know, there's a, a similar conjecture about integrability for magnetic billiards that, uh, say, for C0 integrability, that if you have a magnetic billiard that's C0 integrable, then the billiard table must be a circle rather than an ellipse. So this, this magnetic field, you know, really changes things in terms of, you know, uh, restricting our, our potential billiard tables for integrability. Now, the, the next part that is certainly relevant to what we might be talking about later this week is uh, what's either called algebraic or polynomial integrability. And so this is what, you know, I'm, I'm gonna call it polynomial integrability, but uh, if you look at some of the earlier papers from 2012 and 2015 um, by Bialy and Miranov, sometimes it's called algebraic integrability, but the definition is the same. So this notion of polynomial integrability uh, this is stated in the, in the setting of magnetic billiards. So and there's obviously a more general definition that, that can apply to say you know, a Hamiltonian system or something like that, but for our purposes, we're interested in this polynomial integrability for magnetic billiards. So if we have some function on the, uh, the unit tangent bundle that is itself a polynomial in the components of the velocity vector uh, and has uh, sufficiently smooth uh, coefficients, this will be this function phi this is going to be a, a polynomial integral of a polynomial integral of the magnetic billiard flow if uh, the, these two conditions hold that, uh, that phi is going to be a, an integral of the magnetic of the magnetic billiard flow. And the, the second is that uh, this integral is preserved under collisions with the boundary. So we're not only just thinking of this in terms of you know, uh, an integral of the, of the geodesic flow, but because this magnetic flow has this collisions with the boundary, we want to make sure that this integral doesn't change with each reflection with the boundary. And that's all we're really saying down here. And this, you know, down here, this is just the uh, you know, interchanging the, the normal component of the, um, or th this, this is the velocity beforehand and the velocity after collision. So with polynomial integrability, there's been a fair amount of work over the last 10 years or so. Uh, first, you know, in general, we, we talked about uh, circular tables being integrable. In 2012, uh, Bialy proved that um, in the particular regime that mu is less than the minimum radius of curvature, if the billiard is C0 integrable, then the, then the boundary is going to be a circle. 
And then uh, when it comes to this, this polynomial integrability, uh, there's been more recent work in the, in the last five-ish years that, uh, that proves that if, that if you have a, um, if you have a polynomial integral in, in velocities, then the boundary must be a circle. And the, there are, there's a, a series of papers here that prove this in the uh, regime when mu is larger than the maximum radius of curvature and when mu is less than the minimum radius of curvature. So in these sort of two extreme curvature cases or these two regimes, um, we do have a result about polynomial integrability that says that if you do have a polynomial integral, then the boundary must be a circle. Now, the other thing that's added here is that uh, they extended their arguments to uh, surfaces of constant positive curvature or constant negative curvature. So you can extend this idea of magnetic failures to a sphere or to hyperbolic space. And this, uh, this polynomial integrability argument still holds. And, and then you know, the last comment here is that uh, this intermediate curvature regime is elusive. There's, there's very little known about that one. And the, the techniques used for the minimum radius of curvature are different than that for the mu being larger than the maximum radius of curvature. And so the, these, uh, you know, these integrability problems are different depending upon what curvature regime you're looking at because the dynamics are qualitatively different. And so then you know, this, uh, this conjecture is mostly proven at the bottom here that if you have a polynomial, you know, if it's polynomial integrable, then, then the, uh, the table is itself a circle because it's been proved in two of the three curvature regimes, but this is still you know, a two thirds, you know, one third conjecture is left out of the three possibilities is, is the, the point here. So in the last few minutes, I'm gonna talk about uh, inverse magnetic billiards. And this is just a, a variant of billiards that is near and dear to my heart. This is where uh, we combine standard billiards and magnetic billiards so that the billiard table itself, this boundary, is just seen as a, uh, a boundary between an, the interior and the exterior of a set. And so we're going to think about having zero magnetic field inside this set and some positive magnetic field outside of the set so that uh, trajectories are going to be straight lines concatenated with circular arcs. And so you know, having this, this inhomogeneous magnetic field that changes from zero and then instantly to, to positive means that you're moving on a straight line. And then as soon as you hit that boundary, you're moving under the influence of, the, of that magnetic field in a circular arc. So we, we can think about uh, this in terms of a, a map or a composition of a billiard map and then a, a, a magnetic billiard map. And there's, you know, because there's this magnetism involved, there are still three curvature regimes, depending upon the relative size of the uh, Larmor radius and the minimum and maximum radiotic curvature. Again, we have some nice pictures just of periodic orbits. The circle is integral. Um, you, know, you, you have this rotational symmetry that gives you theta, you know, theta as, a, um, as an integral of motion. But in the ellipse, things all you know, don't, don't work out the same way they do, that they don't work out in the magnetic setting. Again, we have some nice pictures. This is just half of the phase space for the billiard, uh, for this uh, inverse magnetic billiard in an ellipse. Uh, and you can just take a copy of this and put it next to, uh, next to it just due to the symmetry. And so here, similar picture where these orange dots are the centers of these magnetic arcs. And then the, the blue parts are the uh, straight lines on the inside and then circular arcs on the outside. Purple points are just the, the intersection points of the boundary. In the intermediate case, you have even more really nice invariant curves and this like sea of, of chaos that was occurring. Here, this is just an example of a nice trajectory compared to say one of the chaotic ones. And then when uh, the radius is relatively large, your table is very, very small, but now you're moving on large circles outside of that, uh, outside of that billiard table. And so then things start to look a little more a little nicer where you, where you have a lot more invariant curves and a little less chaos, but there still is some, uh, some chaotic orbits that occur down here and even in between these, uh, these invariant curves. And so of course we can ask uh, the exact same set of questions that we did for Euclidean billiards and for uh, magnetic billiards about uh, 
is there an analog to the string construction? The answer is we don't know yet. Uh, there's also now this, this notion, if we look at, say, some of these pictures, there's, there's a notion of an interior caustic and an exterior caustic that can occur as well. So even here, there, there's kind of an interior caustic from the, the straight line components of these trajectories, and there's an exterior caustic corresponding to these uh, magnetic arcs as well. So we now have interior and exterior caustics. Can we come up with a string construction for one of those? The answer is we don't know. Uh, are there billiards with infinitely many caustics? The answer is yes, and that is something that, uh, that I worked on. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very similar result to that of magnetic, magnetic billiards. And are there billiards with no caustics? This answer is yes, if there's uh, a point that van a vanishing curvature of the boundary. And so really like this, this inverse magnetic billiard is really taking on properties of magnetic billiards. It's taking on properties of regular billiards and some things are the same and some things are different. And so this is a really fun playground to, uh, to understand ideas from billiards and see what is really uh, destroyed by this magnetism and what, is, uh, what kind of survives. I'm on my second to last slide here. I know I'm running out of time, but uh, the point is that very little is known about interior or exterior caustics. Um, here, these are just some, some nice pictures of a thousand, um, of 1,000 uh, iterations of this inverse magnetic billiard map. And there, there, are, um, there are interior caustics that appear to be polygons or even you know, C, you know, C0 curves. Uh, and then these, these centers all seem to lie on some really nice smooth continuous curve and you know, understanding even the centers of these, um, of these arcs is really helpful because there's an analogous way to study magnetic billiards by rather than think of it in terms of position and angle coordinates, you can think of it in terms of uh, a phase space where you are sending the center of one magnetic arc to the center of the next magnetic arc after each reflection. And that's actually what uh, Bialy and Mirnov used on their uh, their polynomial integrability papers is this this alternate construction. So understanding where these centers are and how you know one trajectory gets or one center gets mapped to the next is also something that I would be really interested in understanding. And so to finish up, uh, we we can ask if there are other uh, we can ask about having a, a conjecture about inverse magnetic billiards being C zero integrable or polynomial integrable. It's it's unknown, but uh, I would guess that both of these are true, but uh, it's not it's not at all clear. But it seems like these things these properties are kind of inherited by the by the magnetism and the approaches that are used in, in magnetic billiards. Maybe with some adjustments might work here, but it's not immediately clear. So uh, this is just a summary: Euclidean billiards and ellipse are integrable in this three-dimensional Minkowski space. We have uh, Louisville integrability. We have, top, we have uh, two different types of billiard tables that are topologically distinct and have slightly different dynamics. Um, and then we looked at ma uh, magnetic and inverse magnetic billiard trajectories uh, that are integrable in the circle. And then we can talk about uh, magnetic uh, polynomial integrability and inverse magnetic polynomial integrability as well. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, for a tale of uh, more than uh, two billiards. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions? I can't remember if you are uh, if your uh, trajectory is guided by a magnetic field, whether or not there is some metric you can say that's the geodesic of. Yeah, for for the in the magnetic setting. Yeah, I believe the answer is yes. Um, that I mean, there's there's. So in the magnetic setting, certainly there's a set of, you, know, you, you can think of it as a set of differential equations that it's going to, to solve. All of your trajectories have to you know, satisfy this, yeah. you know, th this equation. And so I think you can probably construct some kind of metric such that those are the geodesics. But, but then of course, I mean, you, you, you can think about this as being on a manifold with boundary and you have to make sure that, uh, yeah. that it's compatible in the proper ways. But can you have two trajectories, <clears throat> sorry, two trajectories please? Uh, yeah, so so there could be these, these products, G 
geodesic. Yeah. Geodesic yeah. Ha ha having points that are, you know, where yeah. shape going yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. So, so that would, so something like that would, would occur in some of these curvature regimes and not others. Uh, so certainly when the radii are sufficiently small, then these, uh, you know, these circles can only get so far apart from one another. So having another one over here, you know, they, they wouldn't touch each other. Yeah, and, it, and this intermediate one, that's where, where uh, some of those problems would occur. Yeah, and then even in this larger one, you can have much larger circles relative to the, the size of the boundary that maybe it is a geodesic you know, here, and then another, you know, another larger circle that can occur there as well. So it's it's very much uh, it's different depending upon which regime you're in. But sorry, wouldn't it occur between the ones at the bottom and the ones at the top? Uh, you know, I mean, like this and, and this. What's the difference between the ones at the bottom and the ones at the top? Yeah. So so in the, in this picture, these are just uh, these are really just showing that you can have magnetic trajectories that move far away from the boundary, yeah. or you can have ones that that still stay very close to the boundary, and in fact. These, if we, if we were to draw these entire circles, these have the same radii. Yeah, but so what, what I was thinking, if you have something in between those, mm -hmm. they sort of exactly touch uh, at the boundary. Well, so, so it, it is possible that, that you can have, say, a, a, a larger circle here that also becomes tangent to a larger circle here. I thought you were asking whether they, whether they could touch at the boundary. No, I meant touch. You know. Okay. Yeah, so you could have something that does yeah, yeah, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. another one that does oh, right. it does that. Uh, so no, I was thinking of oh, two next to each other that would touch. I mean, there, there's going to be this this ref reflection that occurs, and so you can actually draw, say, the the normal to the boundary at that reflection point and reflect that circle across. So there, there is going to be you know, some intersection that yeah. does occur with those. Uh, those trajectories, but that that also you know it, it depends on this this angle theta because you could be sufficiently close to the boundary so that these circles don't intersect inside the boundary like they do here. Over here, these circles certainly would intersect at this point and at another point. Yeah, but that's what I mean. Between that and that, there must be one that we need to interact. So, I mean, getting back to Nathan's question, definitely there there are ways. To try to describe it in terms of some metric that has these as its geodesics, but there are complicating factors, especially in uh, depending upon what regime you're in. I think the difference is also that I mean geodesic flows are always reversible, time reversible, right? And with the magnetic field, it's not time reversible. So I would imagine it's not possible, at least more globally. Yeah, yeah. To think of these as uh, solutions of some. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, maybe if you pick a single one, you could. Yeah. yeah. The physical motivations to study this application. Yeah. So, uh, so one example is uh, even just understanding the motion of, say, two-dimensional electrons uh, can be can be thought about in terms of like a semiconductors and an electron gas and understanding. Uh, how are electrons moving through a, a magnetic field? And this is sort of the, the simplest case of having a, a, an orthogonal magnetic field, but you can certainly add things like an electric field to this, and then you'll have a, a drift that occurs as well. And so this really is sort of the, the baby, very simple example, but still has very complex dynamics. And you can make it more and more complicated depending upon the shape of your table or having a magnetic field that is not as simple and clean as this. These are the sort of structural stability for say when you have two goes to infinity, your magnetic data becomes sort of yeah yeah so so as, as mu goes to infinity yeah. yeah so as mu goes to infinity these you know, these that's the mu is the radius of, of these circles yeah. and so as it gets larger and larger then these arcs become closer and closer to straight line segments. Right. So that in some sense, this, this limits to a standard billiard as mu goes to infinity. Yeah. But then as mu goes to zero, then it just limits to the identity map because these circles get smaller and smaller and smaller. Right, right. So if you can like rise, <coughs> you know, 
some streets for larger use and everything can you make the thing well so so usually these this magnetic field is set to be constant at the at the beginning right and so it's not really it's occasionally studied there's a thing called uh doubly sided magnetic billiards where at each reflection the uh the magnetic field changes from say b1 to b2 so it moves on a larger circle and then a circle of a different radius and and so and, and that's just a small step in that direction of having a, a varying magnetic field but this is mostly studied in just the fixed uh you know fixed magnetic field and therefore fixed radius and because these uh, these curvature regimes have very different dynamics. It would probably probably be very complicated to have the dynamics start here, move over here, and have any kind of realistic way that you can understand what is happening you know, yeah. globally with, with the dynamics, just because these are so very different from one another. I also have one question. Yeah. So if you do the same construction with a not convex. Uh... Mm -hmm. like that one. Yeah. Does it work or what, what so, happens? So what happens is that uh, if, you, if you do the string construction on a non-convex table like this, then it's kind of the same as doing the string construction on the convex hole. All right. So it's, yeah. But it still works. I mean, it still works. It's yeah, fine you, if you have this flat part. Yeah. You're, you're then, you know, it's not quite the same because yeah. of that. So you're changing the table a little bit, but the, the caustic a little bit. Yeah, so it just switches the context all. And let's thank Sean again. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>